saying thank you just for another opportunity to be in your presence. Father, thank you for another opportunity to be amongst the saints. Thank you for another opportunity to be amongst family. Father, we want to thank you for your son who died for our sins. Father, he died. He died for us so that we can be saved. Lord, we want to thank you for the love that you have for us. For even when we were sinners, you died to save us. Now, Father, we ask that your spirit invigorate this place on today. Fill us one more time, Lord. We want to be filled by you. We want to be empowered to do your will, not our will. But we ask that your will be done. Father, move on today. Move from heart to heart. Move from every person, Lord. We ask that you touch someone on today. Someone needs a touch from you on this day, mighty Lord. Someone needs healing in their families, Lord, on today. Somebody's children is lost on today, Lord. We ask that you stretch forth your hand. Send your comfort. Send your peace. Send deliverance to somebody on today, Lord. Somebody is caught up in the depths of sin, and they need to be pulled out of a ditch. Lord, we ask that you send your miracle-working power. Send your healing power today, Lord. Oh, Father. Oh, Father. We groan in the spirit for you, Lord. We want more of thee. More of thee, Lord. We ask that you move, Lord. Move in our homes, Jesus. Move in our schools on today, dear Lord. Touch our children, Lord. Touch their minds, dear Jesus. Give them strength in their minds, Lord. Whatever problem comes their way, Lord, we know that you can solve it. You're a problem solver. You're a miracle worker. You're a burden bearer. You open doors, Lord. You make the crooked path straight. Father, we ask that you do it for our children, Lord, today. Get out of our communities, Lord. Somebody needs help on today, Lord. their lungs. Lord, we ask that you bring us together as a church, Lord. Bring us closer together, Lord. We want to get out there and do your work, Lord. We want to be a positive influence in our community, Lord. We want to help our young men and our young women that are lost. So we ask that you work in our lives and prepare us to work on somebody else and to help somebody else, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray on today. We ask that you bless our speaker. Bless every piece of the body, Lord. Bless every piece of the body in this church, Lord. Give us strength, Lord. Bless our speaker on today. Deliver the word. To deliver the word with authority. To deliver the word with power. To deliver the word with your wisdom. Father, we ask that you be a fence around this church right now, Lord. Protect us from the evil things that come to destroy us. Protect us from the enemy, Lord. In Jesus' name. Now we ask that as we go before on today, that your power, yes, that your healing, yes. change us. We don't want to leave this place the same way that we came in. But we want a new wisdom. We want a new truth on today, Lord. We want your power inside of us to empower us so that we can go to the next level as a church, dear Jesus. And we ask all of these blessings that they be done in your name. In the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And it is. Amen. Somebody say, hey, chapter, there was a king by the name of Balak. And he asked a prophet named Balaam to curse Israel. Y'all read that in the Bible before? Yeah. Yeah. And the prophet said, God is not a man that he should lie. Y'all read that right? Yeah. He's the son of man that he should repent. And he said, what God has blessed, nobody can curse. Yeah. Is this a Pentecostal church? Yeah. Do y'all say amen? amen? I said, did he say what God has blessed, nobody can curse? Yeah. Have you read that in the text? Yeah. Well, that was Israel. What about you? Look at somebody and say, that was Israel. What about you? Look up at the screen and read it. Blessed be the God of our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who have blessed us. Who have blessed us. Who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings. 
around and say, let him have his way. Let him have his way. Somebody say, let him have his way. Let him have his way. Who really cares to give Jesus a praise?
Say 
For from whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence? <clears throat> Even of your lusts that war in your members. Ye lust and have not kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. The adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore your friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, and give grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Uh -huh. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. Be afflicted in mourning, weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning. And your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up. Right. The word of the Lord is rich, is powerful, and blessed. Our thought for today is the haves and the have nots. All right. All right. The haves and the have nots. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful because your word is true. Grateful that you have prepared a word for the people. Prepare now your people to receive your word. That the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in my sight. Oh Lord, my strength, rock, and redeemer of the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Most of you have heard me preach a bunch of times, and as such, I'm sure that most of you are aware that I'm a huge fan of sports. I had a bucket list of possible professions. Professional athlete would have been right there near the top. You watch sports and listen to sports talk radio as much as I do. You often run across discussions that ask trivial things, but they're entertaining nonetheless. And one such example is what is the hardest thing to do? in sports. Uh -huh. In almost every instance, you will hear most commentators who have played or those who make a living covering sports indicate that the hardest thing to do in professional sports is hitting a baseball. You have to have the hand and eye coordination and skill to catch this. Swing a round bat at a round ball that is typically coming to you at average speeds of over 85 miles an hour from only 60 feet, 6 inches away. These statistics, along with a few others, represent the reason why hitting a baseball is such a difficult task. And anybody who's ever seen a baseball game understands that most of the time, people go up there and they don't make contact. The average baseball player only makes playable contact about 25% of the time which means that you could actually become a baseball legend and even in some cases find a place in the Hall of Fame when you did not make contact over 70% of the time. Yeah. Because the expectation for baseball players is, although they work all of their lives to make it to the big leagues to make a hit, most of them simply swing and miss. Uh -huh. My prayer of declaration over your life is the exact opposite in that we are not baseball players. Instead, we are soldiers in the army of the Lord. We don't swing bats to hit home runs. Instead, we have a sword that is used to execute vengeance over the enemy. Our weapons are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. Through the pulling down of strongholds casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Bring into captivity every thought to, to the obedience of Christ. I know that y'all have heard that scripture a bunch of times, but you didn't really catch the juxtaposition because Paul says every thought. He says every thought. That means that 100% of them have to be submitted into the 
obedience of Christ. I hope that you receive it today, that you're not a baseball player who's expected to miss over 70% of the time, but you are a believer who 100% of the time is expected to have your thoughts lined up to the obedience of Christ. Every time you swing, I pray that you knock out any and everything that dare stand in your way. Every time you move, I pray that your steps are indeed ordered by the Lord. Every time you open up your mouth, uh -huh. I pray that it is filled with the praises of God. Every single time you think about every door that God has opened, every way that God has made, when you think about all of the goodness of Jesus and all of that he has done for you. I pray uh, that every time you have a cry within your soul uh, that says, thank you, God, uh, for what it is that you have done for me. Uh -huh. So here it is where you will find that some have argued that hitting a baseball is the hardest thing to do in sports, uh, but there's others that say it's not really that, that the hardest thing to do is instead when a keeper, a goalie in professional soccer has to try to stop a penalty kick from the opposing team. Anybody ever seen football as we call it internationally or soccer? We understand that these occurrences typically take place when one team is getting close to scoring and in order to stop them from scoring, the opposing team commits a foul inside of the foul box. I know that y'all are sitting here looking at me saying sports is on his mind today, but I just explained to you what has been happening to you each time. You are just about to hit the target to grab the mark and make the score. The enemy knows just how close you are, and since they cannot stop you legally, you have been the victim of an ill legal foul. And it did not happen just anywhere. It happened right in the designated space where you are supposed to be protected from such type of fouls. The edge fence of protection was supposed to keep the enemy away from attacking you legally. But some kind of way the enemy got in anyway and committed a violation. You have been hit illegally. You have been kicked and fouled illegally. As most of the time, you find yourself in a position where you should have scored, but you did not score. And while it hurt you, while the damage was done, while you found a temporary stoppage in your progression, you need to understand that we've got a divine referee known as God who has blown the whistle and called a foul on the enemy. And now you are about to have a free kick which significantly increases your chances to score the ball. Percentage-wise, the most difficult thing to do in sports is to stop the opponent from scoring when they have a free kick. Because unlike in baseball, or in, unlike in baseball, excuse me, in soccer or international football, when you try to score, when you have a free kick, barely does the kicker miss. And for somebody under the sound of my voice, your time for your free kick is just a few moments away. You have a scoring opportunity that's a few steps closer. The enemy thought he could pull you down, but all he did was make you just one step closer to your goal. And it is your turn. And you need to look at somebody and say, I I will not miss. I will not miss. I will not miss. It is here where I'm going to shift us away from soccer and baseball and see if I can bring us 
into looking at the book of James. If you have been in Bible study, then you understand that the entire book of James reinforces thematically what we have been studying, and that is milk versus meat. For those of you who are not about been in Bible study, what's happening is we are allowing the Word of God to challenge us to become more spiritually mature believers, the type of who are still needed to learn when we're supposed to be teaching, the type of who have progressed past milk, past the elementary, past the foundational principles that pertain to the things of God, but the type of people who both want and need some meat. Well, the entire book of James is that type of teaching. And as we come to James chapter 4, he has set the stage by challenging the believer on the things that the believer has to say. If you get a chance to read chapter 3, chapter 3 is the chapter where James begins to profoundly teach concerning the tongue. He talks about that no man can tame this little beast uh, that is inside of our teeth and our jaws. He actually juxtaposes it against wild animals uh, of nearly every kind. And also with great ships, talking about the fact uh, that you can almost control every wild animal uh, by sticking a bit in its mouth and making it go where you want to go. He talks about the great ships that have been built, that very small hounds uh, keep the ships going where they are supposed to be, uh, yet although the tongue uh, is much smaller and in much cases uh, much less powerful, it is some kind of way much more difficult to control. So we're looking at all of these things, these instances, and tying them all in together where it's milk versus meat. We're trying to become more mature, and this month we are focused on our finances. And I hope that you are not disappointed that thus far I have not released to you financial principles such as uh, the 80-20 principle where you should be living on 80% or less of what you have been bringing in and reserve 10% for your bank account and another 10% for God. I hope that you are not upset that I have not even asked you to consider giving a great gift or a major sacrifice. As a matter of fact, if you're paying attention, you'll find out that last week our focus brought us into a place where we weren't talking about what we should give. Instead, the focus was to change our perspective and perception on the things that we can receive. And so, as we focus on our finances, it seems that God is navigating this discussion away from that which is typical. And so uh, I hope that you can receive this bit of uh, financial advice that I believe is directly uh, from the throne room of heaven. And I understand uh, that perhaps the greatest tool uh, that you have at your discounting with an MBA, it is not an algorithm that's effective in uh, the stock market, nor is it uh, your ability to trade in your time for money. The greatest financial tool that you have at your disposal. Anybody want to know what it is? The greatest financial tool that you have at your disposal is your mouth. You don't understand it. It's all right. I'll prove it to you because the Bible proves it to you. We quote it and misquote it all the time. But Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and Life, thank you, Reverend Johnson, are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. It's not the power of life and death are in the tongue, but it's the tongue that has the power of death and life. 
The tongue is the focus of that text. It is the subject of that text. And if you were to continue to keep reading, you'll understand the truth is reinforced when we rise above the tendency to reduce scripture to tweets, Instagram posts, and Facebook lines and read the entirety of which what the verse says because that's just the first part of the verse the second part says they that love it shall eat the fruit there of death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof I'm going to say it again I'm right in Proverbs 18 the all of verse 21, death and life is the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Yeah, of course, yeah. uh, this moves us to a place where we have to interrogate uh, the text to find out uh, what is the B part talking about when it says it. Uh, what is the it? Well, subject verb agreement means uh, that the it represented here can only mean power. And of the tongue we know cannot be the subject because it is a prepositional phrase yeah. that literally modifies the subject, which is power, telling uh -huh. us that where the power comes from is the tongue's power. And what power you love, you will eat from. Not from the fruit that it produces, but from the fruit that you love. You didn't catch that. Understand it. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So evidently the tongue can produce two different types of fruit. It can produce fruit of death and it can produce fruit of Y'all with me? So there is two types of fruit that the tongue can produce. The Bible doesn't say that you're going to eat from the type of fruit that the tongue produces. It says what you love, that is from which you shall eat. So that is what is going to make your meal. And so when you look at your paycheck this week, up and against the bills that come, you've got to rehearse in your mind, what have you been saying? Are you speaking from the fruit of life or are you speaking from the fruit of death? Let me see if I can find somebody who just like me says, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. Lord, I cannot afford another one of these bills coming into my life. Here comes another bill that it seems like I got to pay for money that I don't have. Oh, y'all don't say stuff like that. I'm the only person that has ever looked at my bills in comparison to my money and uttered something that does not come with a declaration of the goodness of God. Instead, I have time after time in my life empowered the negative aspect of not having enough to cover what God says I'm able to come. Unfortunately, what you don't understand is that when we've spoken these types of things, these are death statements to which most of us have been eating most of our lives. There are declarations of the fact that you don't have enough. And sometimes we've got to mature and change our perspective to a faith language that understands what real tithing is really about. God doesn't care how much money you give him when he has all of the money at all times. But what God wants you to understand is that your faith has to extend to understand that he can do more with 90% than you can do with 100%. And if I've got a faith perspective, it doesn't matter how little I have, when I 
sacrifice uh, and turn it over to Jesus, uh, he's able to work a miracle uh, in spite of what it looks like. Uh, let me see if I can find a witness. If all I have uh, is two little fish uh, and five loaves of bread uh, and there is a need to feed at least uh, 5,000 people, uh, as the song says, little becomes much uh, when you place it in uh, the master's hand. Uh, I can look at the two sardines uh, and the five slices of bread and say, God, uh, how can we feed all of these people? Uh, or I can give it to Jesus uh, and allow him to break it uh, and allow him to bless it uh, and allow him to give back to me uh, more than I've ever given to him uh, and watch the miracles of God flow. Uh, you got to understand a faith language says and my God uh, shall supply uh, all of your needs uh, according to his riches uh, in glory by Christ Jesus. You've got to have faith not just to think about it, not just to get happy in church, but you've got to say it because your words have power. This is what James is communicating to us in the text. That when it is that church people who should know better and who should have a higher standard of living than those in the world to begin to speak out against one another. James makes an attribution that says it has the same quality as going to war. And so he begins to ask, why is there fighting among you? Why are you using your tongue and arguing when this is the greatest instrument that you have to do damage against the kingdom of the devil? And you're using it to do damage to the kingdom of God and fighting against one another when we should be working together. James attributes this to being the equivalent of being a literal murderer. He says you are a killer and since you can't get what you're supposed to have, you have got to the place where you're ready to kill somebody before it. You can't have what you desire, so you are literally willing to kill in order to get it. I learned a long time ago that if you will lie, you will steal. And if you will steal, then you will kill. And the Bible says, will a man rob God? If you'll rob God, then you'll rob me. And if you'll rob me, you'll rob anybody. Because you've got a mentality that says, since I can't trust God with it, I'll lie and hold on to it as opposed to releasing it to him. James is the one who says, this mentality is breaking down the church because you don't have real faith in the one who is supposed to, to be your supply. Not your supplier, but God is our supply. You're worried about resources when the word is our source. James says, unfortunately, we devolve in to resorting to means that cannot produce the results that you need. And so here it is where we've got to have a moment of transparency to say, I am guilty of trying to figure out how I'm going to make ends meet as opposed to allowing God to do what God does. He is a provider. I've been guilty. Y'all ain't going to be honest with me today. That's all right. I've been guilty of trying to make things happen, getting part-time jobs, getting loans, robbing Peter to pay Paul, and still being broke with. God makes it very clear. You can work all the jobs that you want to work. You can take out all the loans that you want to take out. Uh, you can rob Peter, Paul, and James, uh, and John, uh, and you're still going to be broke because uh, you have not followed the plan uh, that God 
God has prescribed. You have not because you ask not. And when you ask, you don't receive because when you ask, you ask amiss. It comes down to this idea, which side are you on? Are you going to live your life as a have or are you going to live your life as a have not? Thank you, Sister Desayla. I know that when y'all hear these words, you are thinking the same thing that you will see. That this is a Tyler Perry series that helped save the Oprah Winfrey Network. And most of y'all who are watching this foolishness are recalling scenes from the fictional lives of the Criers and the Harrington's. The Criers and the Harrington's are the haves. While the young happen to be the have not. So, well, before Tyler Perry or Oprah was ever thought about, it is the word of God that gives us these lines of demarcation and identity for these two groups of people. And unlike the television show, it has nothing to do with the family to which you were born. It has nothing to do about the job to which you are employed. It is not the inheritance that you have or have not received. The first thing we need to acknowledge is that the reason any of us got on two shoes today, a shirt and some underwear, is because of the grace and mercy and goodness and kindness of God. I don't care how much you work. I don't care how much money you put in the bank. The only reason you got food to eat and a place to sleep is because of the grace of God. That's the reason why any of us has. Thank you, Sister Beulah, for that clap. But here is the reason why you have not. It has nothing to do with God. You have not because you ask not. God's not the one who's on trial here. The trial that you need to be having is with your tongue. Because God says, I give grace to anybody who needs it. But your problem is you're broke. And you have not. Not because you didn't work hard enough. But simply because you didn't have faith to ask God. I think I'm reading your mind right now. Because somebody is thinking, I know I asked and I'm still broke. I know I have come to God. I fasted and prayed. And I'm still a member of the young family. I'm still not where I'm supposed to be. Well, let me help you with your problem. Your problem is that you have asked. You have used your mouth, but when you have asked, you have asked a miss. So I heard this sermon before. That word simply means you ask improperly or with ill intent, or you ask wrongly, or the implication is the reason why you asked is because you're miserable. Meaning that the reason you have not received is because the only motivation that you asked is not because you got faith that God's going to give it to you. You think in your mind, I'm tired of being a have not. And the only desire for asking is to be a have. Well, God is not blessing have nots to become haves unless have nots have the mindset that when I become a have, my purpose is to become a give. And as long as your purpose of being a have not is to become a have, then your ask will become a miss. I'm done. But when you allow God to change your ask, God will change your miss into a make. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. That's why he says, I give grace to the humble. I give strength to the weary. I increase the power of the weak. You ever heard this one before? Ah, he gives seed to the 
soak. He gives love to the cheerful giver. How oh, we want God to fix our finances. But what God needs is to fix your mind so that in time you come to the Lord. You come understanding that I'm not asking just to move my status from being a happy
people think that all the church wants is your money. When the hardcore critique is some ministries have devolved into that. That's all you want. But most of us, if we understand the principles in God's Word, I would dare say most pastors are trying to get the minds of the people to connect with the mind of God. And giving is a biblical principle that every single time you see it in action, it brings reward and recompense to the giver. I'm done. Tithing is one of those things where You'll hear people tell you that you don't have to tie. And the simple truth is that you don't. And I'm not even saying it tongue in cheek like you don't have to tie. And if you don't, God's going to curse you. Man. That's God has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Jesus yes. of the curse of the cross. Teach. We don't have to be cursed. There is a very important principle within the Word of God that teaches us that the blessing of Abraham is made available to the believer. And we're talking about years, as in centuries, before Moses ever got the Pentateuch and started handcrafting the law. Abraham found himself in a position where God gave him a victory and kind of unprovoked or pronounced, he gave a tithe to the priests. And there isn't any previous biblical precedent for it. Now Abraham was a very wealthy guy. If you ever get a chance to read Genesis 12, 13, 14, you'll see that he took on kings with an army of men that he trained in his household. But for some reason, it seems as if his great wealth is, is attached uh -huh. to his mindset of being a great giver. And all throughout scripture you see people giving major things to God. And what God does is he blesses them. Yes. I want you to hear me, I'm done. Story, the birth of Samuel. You look at the story of the birth of Samson. And you will find, particularly in the story of Samuel, that his mother had no children. And you know what she asked God? She asked God for a child that she could give back to God. Oh, yeah. It's the weirdest kind of thing of all time to think about it. Why would you ask me to give you this precious thing that you're not even going to have? And so it speaks to a mindset of asking right. Yeah. And I know that this is 
a tough scripture to deal with because it makes us have to take inventory of why do I have? And the only explanation is I must not have asked or I asked with the wrong intent. Now we have some things as a collective before God. I ask them publicly on purpose so that you can hear it, so that God can hear it, so the enemy can hear it, so everybody can hear it. And we are expecting God to do for us. And I'm certain that you have some things in your life that you're expecting God to do for you. But the question today is, am I asking right? Why do I want this? What is the motivation behind what it is that I want? temporary fix that does not address the real problem. If you find yourself in a position where you feel like you need to change your conversation, I want you to meet me at the altar. If you're finding yourself in a position where you have to say, you know what, God, I have not received for some reason. What am I doing wrong? I need you to get the answer. There's a song that says, Lord, when I pray, give me what to say. If you find yourself in a place where you have a need before God, that can't wait for me. Till Thursday. I want you to meet me at the altar. Because our prayer today is God fix my conversation. Help me to speak life as opposed to speaking death. So that I can live on the fruit of what I love. Help me to ask the right questions. Help me to have the right motivation. Help me to turn my miss into a make.
as you as you process through this group, that you make this your daily declaration. As you read the verses aloud, at least twice a day, once in the morning, and once on time in the evening. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord of my soul and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowned thee with love and kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfies thy mouth with good things. So that thy youth is renewed. Like the eagles. Psalms 103 put that into your devotional time this week and allow the Lord to minister to your heart and to your life. Amen. 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 We're going to get ready to get you out of here for this afternoon.